My dear friends, without the further delay, I now request our chief guest of today, Sanjay Mehta, to bring here on the dais. Good evening everybody. Good evening, sir. Thank you for inviting me here today and uh, it's a pleasure to share some thoughts and insights with you about uh, social media and social media marketing in particular. So <coughs> as was mentioned, the specific, sorry. Specific subject within social media marketing, uh, what we are going to discuss today is around reaching youth markets and looking at what is what is more specific around youth markets and how social media can particularly address that. So I think I've already been introduced, so uh, just quick recap. So Home India was the first venture that uh, in terms of the internet side of businesses which I started. Then there was a small stint at company for days and currently uh, I run Social Media Blend, which is perhaps India's largest social media agency. So we are about 170 people in four cities in India and we work with uh, so this is a partial list of clients who are who we work with for social media services which we offer. So just to get you a perspective of sort of where the background is and how how does how do these insights come across. So this is from working with all these companies. Anyway, this is what uh, I'll try and cover in this short talk today. Some fundamentals of social media specific insights around youth markets, consumer insights. Uh, I'm told that that's one of the uh, subjects which you already have. So probably you'll identify with some of these things which I will, which I will talk about. And how brands can connect with youth markets, especially using social media. And then just as an example, we'll look at a case study. So that's what I'll be covering just now. So specifics, uh, basic fundamentals of social media, although uh, all of us, I'm sure, live and you know engage on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever. Uh, and yet, if I'm including this, you know, fundamental ideas of social media, it's with a purpose. So just so that everybody gets clarity in terms of social media in re regards to a strategy for brands. You know, how do we look at it? Not as a, just as a consumer, how we use social media for ourselves but more from a marketing <coughs> perspective, right? So, the outset, what is social media? There's, there's lots and lots of uh, versions of definitions which one could give or views that may give. And a lot of times when we say what is social media and people say, oh, it's Facebook. So that's like a, like a quick jump to a best known name in social media, but really to understand and define social media in a certain sort of technical way, here's how we look at it. Social media is, the online technologies and practices that people use to share opinions, insights, experiences and perspectives. So I repeat this, so all of these uh, aspects, all of these uh, words which are used have relevance. So first of all, it's the online technologies and practices. So we are not talking about few of us getting together at a cafe coffee day and having you know, social interaction. That's social but that's not social media in a context like this. Second part is that social, the, the online technologies and practices that people use, okay. So nowhere in this sort of definition does a company or a brand feature because at its core social media is about people and what people are engaging with each other on an online platform. That's the core. You must uh, understand and appreciate that. 
And why do people use this? To do what? To share. It is again, I'm not sure if uh, some of you might have had a chance to, you know, today is Facebook's 10th birthday, right? Uh, you might be aware. And Mark Zuckerberg has put out a post from his side. And I think he essentially emphasizes that, you know, the core of Facebook also has been about sharing. So sharing is the key, and what do you share? You share opinions, insights, experiences, perspectives. They may come out as a, as a blog, they may come out as a, as a Twitter tweet, they may come out as, a, as an image which you shoot and share, but it's all about <coughs> essentially sharing. So this is, uh, at its core, what social media is. And as you can see, and as I emphasize, in the definition there is no mention of brand or company. So where do brands then come in and what? Are there any opportunities for brands? If it's all about people and people's conversation and interaction with each other, where <coughs> then do brands feature here? So the opportunities that brands have are a few. Now I'm going to take very little time on social media fundamentals because I, I'm sure in, in, a, in a different way or in the same way all of you would have an appreciation. This is just so that we get our fundamentals in place before we look at you know youth markets and stuff like that. But let's let's appreciate that. What are the kind of opportunities that brands have in a space which is otherwise meant for people? If it's otherwise all about people-to-people -people conversation, interactions, exchanges, brands still have an opportunity. The first opportunity is the opportunity to listen. So, so if you're a brand, typically there would be conversations happening about you, whether you are there or not. So, so if you are a bone wheel. People are going to be tweeting Bonneville or sharing Bonneville. If you are a Lux, if you are an Airtel, if you are a Vodafone, if you are Star TV, whatever you are, if there is a brand involved, people are referring to you in some way, whether good, bad, ugly, whatever. Even if they are not talking about you, there is a good chance that they are talking about your category, whatever business you are talking, which in which you are in, all your competitors. All those conversations are happening. Now, as a brand, then you have an opportunity to listen in. There are social media tools <coughs> available which can allow you to fetch conversations across the entire space of the social web, whether it's blogs, forums, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, etc., which have mention of certain keywords which you choose. You can choose keywords which are your brand names, you can choose keywords which are your competitors' brand names or whatever, and fetch those conversations. And by listening in, as a brand, you get a sense of many things. You get a sense of how is your brand perceived by the people? What do they really think? You, you have tried to build a brand in a certain way, but is that what the, the, the consumer is really thinking about you? What do they think of competition? What are competition insights? Are they, are they doing better than you? Are they have a better connect with the consumer? All sorts of different things are what you can learn. You can learn consumer preferences. So if you are in a product and you know consumer is saying, oh I wish this was available in a green color or whatever, you are getting some sense of consumer requirements, consumer preferences, wish lists, all those things. So that's the first step. Understand what the consumer is talking about you, your category, your competitors, etc. That's your first opportunity as a brand direct understanding from the consumer. Once you kind of get it, then guess comes to the next opportunity. The next opportunity is to talk. So you listen. Now, actually, what happens is that most of the time, social media initiatives are led by marketing departments and companies. And marketers, as they are, they love to talk. They love to go out and create communication, put communication out. Uh, the reality is that this is an interactive medium. And if you are not knowing what your consumer wants from you, what is what you have not listened, and you just put out whatever you think, it's one more advertising channel there. You know, you put out a hoarding, you put out a television ad, and you'll go to social media and put out your communication. But the, maybe the consumer doesn't even want to hear that. Maybe he has some questions he wants to know. He, maybe there are some other engagements, other conversations which he wants to have with you. So ideally, listen first, and based on the listening, go out and create your communication so that it becomes relevant to the consumer. So that's actually the second opportunity that brands have. Once there is a basic listening and talking happening, then comes a third opportunity which is engage. Engagement is where you are now actually, you know, maybe asking the consumer for some opinions, 
creating some market surveys, running some contests, running some other you know, uh, interactive engagements with the consumer, that's the third opportunity, which as a brand you have. Which then leads to potential evangelizing. That's when your consumer carries your story forward. So when he or she shares the story or talks to their network about what a great experience they've had with you on social media, that's when your brand messages are getting further amplified and carried out. And there is no better way to reach your message out than from a customer himself or a consumer himself rather than you carrying it. So that's your fourth opportunity. Now, when I'm writing them in a sequence, typically, this is the journey that a brand should take. The brand would love to jump to evangelizing. But if you've not done your listening, talking, engaging well, brands are not just going to take your message and share it with others because you've not even connected back with them yet. So ideally it has to happen in a sequential manner. And the final opportunity is what we call as adopting. Now, adopting is a very, very interesting stage which you can reach as a brand. Adopting is about, as a brand, doing what your customers want you to do. I mean, it's, it's uh, a brand and companies talk that you know, we are here for our customers and we'll do what our customers want. But that's all just, you know, just talk, it's lip service. In reality, most brands and most companies say, you know, here's my product, I want to sell it, I want to make this money. All these other things are just lip service, I would call it. But when you, act, when you are engaged deeply in social media and you reach a stage of what I would call as adopting, as a brand, you're in that stage where you're actually doing what your customers want. Examples, concepts like crowdsourcing, concepts like co-creation. Not sure if you've heard of them, but let me give an example of a very well-known brand, Starbucks, right? So Starbucks runs this website called mystarbucksidea.ideas.com. mystarbucksideas.com. What that website does is that it enables anyone, you know, you, me, anybody, any, anyone as a consumer can go to this site and put in a wish list that we have for Starbucks. So we may put in that, you know, it would be great if Starbucks would serve juices also besides coffee and tea and all that. That's my wish list. Okay. So you can give a wish either in product category or in ambience or in the, in the way it's served. Uh, the chairs in the in the Starbucks outlet, whatever, <coughs> under whatever category of suggestion you may have, you can go and give the suggestion. What also happens is that there are, like you and me, there are many, many other people who are also going to the same page and your suggestions are visible to everybody. Others who see the suggestion might have a view on it. So they may vote that suggestion up or down. So if I, I see the suggestion of Starbucks serving juice and I don't like it, no, no, I think Starbucks has a certain character which is around tea and coffee and all. I don't think Starbucks should serve juice, so I vote it down. Okay, and I give my justification with in a comment there. Okay, so like that, besides one, two people, there are hundreds or thousands of people who are doing this. And there are hundreds or thousands of suggestions which are out there under various categories. What has Starbucks done? It has just created this platform and then it is sitting by the side and watching consumers engage amongst each other on various things that the consumer thinks that Starbucks must do. Okay, they are just sitting and just watching the whole thing. In time, suggestions which have a lot of acceptance and a lot of upwards tend to keep moving up. And the ones which don't have traction, only some you know, few people want it, they are remaining there or they go down. So Starbucks looks at the ones which have got a lot of upwards and have moved up. That means that a lot of Starbucks customers want those things to happen, whatever those suggestions are. And Starbucks acts upon them in most cases. So they will go out and actually respond on the same platform saying that, okay, this is a great suggestion. Uh, we will take it up for implementation. They may even put out things like uh, North American outlets will see this happening from next quarter and it will be rolled out in the rest of the world over the next few quarters or whatever. Some answers like that, they will actually put out. Now, you as a customer, if you are in North America, you know, two, three months later, you walk into another Starbucks outlet and you see a change. Maybe you see the tissue paper, which is made of organic paper, which is eco-friendly or whatever. 
which was your suggestion or which one which is a suggestion you voted up and you see that there you see because you're a regular you see a change and you feel that oh wow Starbucks is doing what I asked them to do your connect with the brand increases you feel bonded you feel it's my Starbucks is happening the way I want it to so that's that's a really really powerful force of course Starbucks may not take up all the suggestions because some may be pra not practical so they may even for certain suggestions they may say yeah this is a good idea but logistics doesn't allow us to do this at this point for example here's a dialogue which is being set up between the brand and the consumers they are being transparent they are being open they are telling consumers that hey I value your suggestion but look because of certain logistics reason this cannot happen now in doing all this this is that stage of adoption they have essentially done co-creation they are creating next product next service along with their consumers now if the consumers are telling us what to do and you do that isn't it a most likely that the consumers will keep coming back and engaging because they, you're giving them exactly what they want as against giving them one more new type of coffee or some new beans or something right so that's the stage can you jump straight to that unfortunately not you have had to create that all those three four stages before <laughs> to have engaged the consumers on all those platforms <coughs> created their connect at which point consumers are going to come back and you know maybe give participate in your next product or next service or something so those are the five key opportunities and the kind of journey that a brand should take on social media and uh, then comes the actual strategy how does one go about it you know so that listening talking all that is sounds a little theoretical but if I have to say that okay if I am a brand what do I do tomorrow how do I get started what, what's the first thing I need to do so that brings you back to the fundamentals of marketing and you know talk about the four P's so on social media strategy also it's about the four P's with small difference and which, which I will tell you what it says the first P is again about people who are the kind of people you want to reach if you're a you're a brand what is the person so normally companies are able to define it in terms of demography that yeah I'm looking my my target audience is male 18 to 24 cities metro urban this that whatever that's the kind of way in which a brand is usually able to define the audience which is fine which is what you know can you now map that audience also to their possible behavior on social media what is it that they could be doing on social media because that's the crucial part and that's known as social media technographics or words of that kind have been used to describe that just how you describe demographics this is technographics or something now what are the different kinds of behavior that a, a person can have on social media one is that they could be authors what that means is that they are creating original content uh, that could be a blog, it could be a photograph, it could be a YouTube video which they make, it could be a tweet, that's also original content. As long as you're creating some original content, you're a kind of an author. That's your first type of behavior. The second could be that a person is a critic. What's a critic? A critic is somebody who may not create original content, but when he sees some other content, so when I see a, a blog, I'm if I'm a critic, I would maybe go and put some comment on it or if I see a tweet I might reply to a tweet so that's a critic somebody who's open to go and give a response the third kind is what you would call as collector or curator now who's a collector or curator he's a person who will share content so he knows that oh this is an interesting article my friends in this group will find it interesting so he'll share it to that group on Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever so he's helping his friends to get the kind of content that they, they, they think they will like so that's an art act of curation so that's a third kind of behavior fourth is a behavior of joiners people who join groups of various kinds so you may join a group on Facebook on Twitter or sorry on LinkedIn or wherever that's a joiner category fifth is a category of consumer it means consumer in the sense consumer of content so that person doesn't create content, doesn't necessarily, you know, criticate, doesn't join anything, doesn't uh, curate, but they will read blogs, they will see videos, they will get, they will take inputs. 
So they are a consumer of content. That's another behavior. And the last kind of behavior is the person who is inactive. He's not on social media or he's not active on social media. Now to better understand this, let's let's again give analogy of more real world. So assume that this hall was full of another event where there were six speakers on the stage. It was a, some kind of a conference and this room was busy, full up. And each one spoke one after the other. And then the speaker said any questions and you know one, two, five, ten maybe questions came up in the while the session was on. When the session got had a break for tea, people walk walk out and they huddle in small groups. And they are all discussing something. And then there are a few people who are standing at the corner and sipping their own individual cup of tea and watching everything, whatever is going on. They are not talking, they are not mixing much. Now let's do the analogy. The people on the stage you created who spoke, they were like the authors. They created their content, they shared some original content of theirs. The people who put up their hands and asked questions in the hall, they were like the critics. They were open to ask questions in, in public. They didn't, they didn't kind of fear embarrassment or things like that. Sometimes you feel, oh, I have a very stupid question, should I ask, not ask? So some people hesitate. It's a real world, real world scenario, but these guys were okay to ask questions. The people who walked out and then huddled together, you know, in small groups, they were talking the same same subject they were talking out. They were like the joiners. So in a certain comfort zone of people they know and fam are familiar with, they were open to converse. They were not so much open to put up a hand in the hall, but they were open to converse in their small comfort groups. The people who are sipping their own individual cup of tea and watching everything, they are like the consumers. They are consuming everything. <laughs> they will also get inputs of all the you know, things which happened. And they will also have a value add. They will go back enriched. But they are not participating beyond that. And those who didn't even come for the event, they are sitting at home, they are the inactive people. So there is an analogy to real life. Social media is not something which has just happened. It is very similar to society in that sense. Behavior is very reflective of social behavior. And that's what we are talking about. So if you are working on creating a strategy for your brand, you have to try to identify where does your target audience fit in. Now usually it's not that a person does only one thing. You have to look at the predominant behavior. That if my consumer, supposing I am addressing a market which is of doctors, okay, medical practitioners. I say, okay, they are busy, they are not really likely to be doing too much of author work themselves, they may not even critic, but they will be definitely consumers of content because they like to consume and get new things for themselves. Maybe some of them might be joiners, so they have a medical group or a friends group, they may join that. So my intuitive understanding that my, if I am looking at doctors, maybe the place where they belong is either consumers or joiners more likely. It's a gut feel, I mean, you know, generally you have to get that call. So like that you have to identify who are your people, your, the people you are trying to reach for your brand, where do they most likely fit in? Sir, the example which you gave in which who are, like, who are collectors or curators? Collectors, so maybe it's not always easy, maybe they are the people who will, you know, if they go to an exhibition, they will pick up uh, brochures from all the booths and then they will go to their office and share it with their people or something, they are collectors. You know, they went to the exhibition and picked up from every booth, they took all the catalogs and brochures and then they went and shared back. So something like that, you know, it may not always happen in that particular analogy of a speech and a conference, it may happen in a different kind of scenario. But yeah, that sort of a behavior, yeah. So coming to the second peak, once you know, yeah. So you talked about uh, identifying the target segment. So are there like thumb rules or tools by which you can actually do it uh, in a quick or easy manner? So it's, a, so it's not very scientific, it's largely intuitive and it's also iterative. So you know, you, supposing, let me finish this slide and then we'll come to that. This is just like, so and we'll come back to your question. So the, the first is identifying which of these behaviors your consumer, your target audience mostly fits in. Then come to the second P which is the purpose. What are you in social media for as a brand? Why are you here? Are you here to create brand awareness of your brand? Are you here to increase sales? Are you, do you want to generate sales from this effort? Or are you here to create maybe customer service out here on this platform? 
whatever it is, identify the reason why you are on social media as a brand. Now, in in real world, in a more physical world, you know, a sales department is separate, a marketing department is separate, a customer service department is separate, and all of them have their own strategy and work and all that. So it's not like you come to social media and all of these purposes can happen through one strategy. It cannot because each one demands its own effort, own you know kind of strategy approach. So if you have four purposes which you think you can serve on social media, you need to virtually create four different strategies. Don't try to merge them because you can't service four different goals with one direction. So here you uh, absolutely uh, articulate the reason why your brand is on social media, which is the purpose, second P. Once you know who are the people, once you know what is the purpose, that tells you, that gives you the plan. That, okay, so if my uh, target audience is, let's say, joiners, and my purpose is to increase brand awareness for my brand, then my plan should be that I should create some forum or something which these people will join, and there I will create brand content so that these people who have joined will find it of interest and brand awareness will increase and they will go and find more people of their kind and who will come and also join and gradually my brand awareness will increase. This is a fundamental plan at a very top level which gets detailed into a fourth P which is process. So I got my fundamental plan, now I have to detail it out of the process that okay which platform should I choose, will it be Facebook or LinkedIn, what will be the numbers like you know if I get in the end of six months, if I get 5,000 people, is it a good number, bad number? What is the benchmark? What are the global standards? Which amongst my competitors are already there? So those kinds of process, how, how will it flow day after day? How will it flow week, month? How does it go? All those things are the detailed metrics and all those numbers that becomes a part of the process. So that becomes broadly your strategy. And pretty much most brands and most scenarios, if you can kind of understand, try to put this structure in, you will have at least a plan to begin with. Now the point to answer the question is that you are finally all this is a there are certain intuitive so one is a sense of having fun. Okay. Now the interesting part here is it's not just about having fun when you're actually having fun. It's not like the fun at the fun times, but even the youth also want to have an element of joy in work or in studies or whatever. So how the whole concept, for example, of gamification, you know, I mean, why, why, are, pe why are companies and brands and all creating gamification even in work or in studies or whatever, the, the whole concept of leaderboards and, you know, even in an education system or whatever. It's because there's an element of fun that people want to have. You know, I told you earlier that we have about, you know, totally 170 people working in Mumbai office. We have about 125 in one single big room. And you know, I, you know, we are in the cabin, but every half an hour, every one hour, suddenly there will be a flurry of clapping and shouting, you know, and I don't even know really because inside the cabin, I can't connect, but they're all young. All of my team is maybe 25, around 25 or under. <coughs> they're having fun. The work, they're at work. You know, I know I have run traditional businesses in the past and you know, old economy, you know, there was pin drop silence, people were like, focus on work, but today's environment is different. Today, young people want to have fun. And if it, if it became stiff and they, they were not allowed that, they would not want to work with us. You know, the fact that they are able to have fun while they're working is a big motivator. So fun is a, a integral part of a young person's life today. Second understanding which we get out of the whole consumer insight is a quick answer to the question that what's in it for me okay so while there will be all these armchair activism on you know national issues and global issues and all that if I'm asking somebody to take a certain step a certain action that come out and do this more often than not the answer should have clear you know the answer will be clear to the person that okay if I'm doing this what's in it for me and it's not that it's all about selfishness it could be that he is going to make a difference in this society, in this community, whatever. As long as that clarity is there, that here, this is the answer, and then I'm going is, if it's fuzzy, if it's not clear, and if it's some, you know, some long-term goal which is I, I can't identify with, it doesn't get traction. Okay. Now, this, some of these things, you might say, okay, are these only things which happen in social activism or something like that? 
these are also relevant for brand activity. So if a brand does some contest or some competition on Facebook, on Twitter and all, does it get traction, does it not get traction? Sometimes if you miss this, some, some of these crucial parts, if the consumer doesn't quite get that, okay, why should I do this? If the young person doesn't get it, your, your engagement may not get the traction which you would like it to get. And you're saying, you start wondering that, okay, I've done this, there are these gifts, there are these prizes, why are people not connecting? There could be that, you know, this part, one of these things may not be very clear, that what's in it for me? The third is an interesting element of fame. Even if it's what they call as 15 seconds of fame. I mean, here's what you see is uh, some activation where person <laughs> had their picture on, uh, on an out of home, on a hoarding in Broadway on in New York City, right? That sort of thing, and, you know, even for a moment, so, oh, I got my 15 seconds on KBC or, you know, on some such, uh, you know, I had a chance to shake hands with Salman Khan or whatever it may be. So there's a big driver, uh, opportunity to get that fame, visibility, uh, all that is a big driver uh, for young people. Bollywood continues to be a big factor, you know, so Im impact of Bollywood, what Bollywood shows, what kind of, you know, stories or drama or music or whatever it is, has uh, continuous here. And when we're talking across the country, we're talking a certain cross-section of youth, not very necessarily only metro, only urban, but across uh, at least tier two, tier three put together. And Bollywood continues to have a major impact on, you know, behavior. Music is continues to be again a factor now. Music, it's the interesting thing is, music was always big for people, especially young people of whatever, maybe a generation, two generation back also. What has changed is the way music is experienced and what is done with music. So whether it is about, uh, you know, creating your own music, you know, mixing some tracks or creating, or, or the way music is shared, whether through a Bluetooth or, you know, you know, the way you kind of basically engage the, the way you co create a cover for your for your music or you know uh, personalization all of those elements are a part of experiencing and engaging around the concept of music and so again if you if you work as a brand and you say oh music is big and let me give them some music to experience that will not be enough can you tell them that, you know, take this, like what happened to Kolavari, right? Kolavari, besides the fundamental track which became big, people created versions of it. There was a Punjabi Kolavari and a Tamil Kolavari and whatever. Now all of these were the big highs, you know, I can turn around, I can create a fast version of it and a slow version of it and this and that and there was a high around that. So that's the kind of thing, you know, ripping it and doing things with it, that's the kind of elements of music which are uh, which are big drivers again amongst the youth. This concept, I'm not sure if you can read it, it says, it's all about now. Like, I want instant gratification and I want it now. I mean, it's like that's a height of impatience that don't tell me that I should do something today and then I have to do something more next week and then the fourth week and after three months maybe I'll get a prize. It's not going to work. Okay. People don't have that kind of patience. So if you have, supposing you were a brand and you created some engagement which needs the person to do multiple things over a long time and then maybe he has a chance to win, chances of that kind of an engagement becoming successful are very poor. On the other hand, if you have something that every day there will be five winners, every day some, some things will be up for grabs, things like that. You know, so I, I get the chance that, okay, I do this. And I, you know, in a matter of a few hours, I get to know if I won something, if I did something. So it's like that. Right? Instant gratification is the key. So again, thinking about engagement with the youth, if you take this as a fundamental, as a take as a concept that yes, when I create something, I should have an ability to give the youth something quickly, not having to make them wait. It's also a part of today's culture. It's all about the attention spans of people are so small that if I engage something, you know, for a week, it doesn't connect back, I've already forgotten. Because there's so many other things which can't come, keep coming into my life and my head that I'm, I'm not even bothered about it. You know, so it's like that. So you're, if you have quick results, while it is fresh, while I'm still alive into it, I get an answer, I get some response. So that's, that's the other driver. 
human continuation will be trying to you know whether it's Alok Nath or Neil Nitin Mukesh or any of this kind. I mean, especially you know the element of the it's an interesting thing. What makes things like Alok Nath go viral? I mean, it's not just about the humor. It's also about humor at somebody's cost. Cost is not that you're harming anybody, but it's like you know a candid camera kind of thing, or you know those uh, spoofs that are run, or you know on radio the radio jockey calls somebody and you know pretends to be somebody else and then makes fun of the person. Now, those are the kind of elements of humor which seem to be pretty hot. Uh, amongst you, so and that's reflected in things like Neil Nitin Mukesh or all these things which have gone wild. They're making fun of a person, you know, making fun of a style or whatever. And not that we mean anything to these guys. You know, I, you know, I'm sure all of the people who enjoyed those jokes have nothing against Alok Nath. You know, they don't even probably know who he is, but you know, everybody had a good laugh and kind of became wild. You know, a matter of a day or two, it just flew, right? So that's the kind of humor which is integral. So if you were a brand and you wanted to work your way into the youth market through humor, again think those elements. How can you make it make it interesting for them? Next element is about thrill. Okay. Thrill is it's it again what has happened in these days is even the enjoyment of thrill has gone to a different level. So you know, adventure and you know going on some tracks and you know going climbing a mountain all those things were there but today thrill has also taken a different kind of a meaning it's it's about you know breaking a signal on your motorbike in front of a cop the cop was there and i cut the signal and i came back and told my friend this is what i did now that's the thrill you know like you flaunting a certain high of that kind it's an example i mean so that those are the kind of things which are so going at little on the edge or probably beyond the edge uh, is, is again an element which you seem to identify. And I find it funny that I'm talking to all of you, all of you are youth and I'm not and yet I'm trying to tell you what, what you guys supposedly like and you might probably be disagreeing with a lot of these but the, the thing is these are based on some research and some insights and seem to work. I mean you know there is a, when well, you've seen this you also gone and seen engagements which work, brand activation which work and which didn't work. And some of these elements have come from there and also on through, of course, consumer interviews and research and all that. Again, an interesting turn of romance. I mean, today's world, romance has different meaning. It's, it's not so much about, you know, Sat, you know, whatever, Sat Janam Sat and all that. It's, it's, uh, it's a different kind of, you know, it's like this uh, Mutsi friendship karogi and those kind of, uh, Romance where there is on one side there is intense uh, possessiveness. Uh, I have WhatsApp and it's 15 minutes and he has still not replied, <laughs> or maybe five minutes and whatever. I mean, those kind of obsessiveness and what happened, you know. It, it's uh, it's it's funny. I mean, I find it funny because I'm from a different generation, but that's the reality. I think those kinds of things about you know not really long-term relationship, fine, you know, break up, make up, all those things are also quite uh, quite routine. They're all different from, uh, you know, a generation back or something. So, uh, again, how does it work is, if you were looking at using a romantic angle, so, you know, brands, all brands will want to do something on Valentine's Day, you know, like, it's like, these are the brand opportunities of engagement and they'll do something, but if they use these elements, of some of these elements somehow weave them into their engagements or their brand you know activity on a Facebook or a Twitter or whatever, there's a good chance that they will get better traction if they understand those finer insights of behavior. Tech is again a major, major driver. Now today, okay, so I mean we, we all know the numbers, you know, hundreds of millions of phones and all that, but how is it relevant from a consumer behavior pattern is for a generation earlier what the two-wheeler or four-wheeler did a mobile phone is doing that to today's generation now what did it do it was the vehicle to independence to being away from family to go somewhere and not be bothered by parents or whatever you had an escape and at, at a certain age 
you know, youth, young people want to have that escape, to have their own time with their friends, their alone. Today, a person, uh, you know, a young person could be sitting in the same hall or the same room and feel that same level of independence because he or she is immersed in her phone, which is her private space, and you know, it's like she's lost, and it's it's independence. You know, you don't you you wouldn't want to go and peep into that if you are not the person. You don't. She won't allow you to look at it. But it's that same vehicle of feeling of an independence. Of course, tech means there's elements of tech about what's a new phone, new feature, and a new app, and all those things are elements which are there. But from a behavioral pattern, the bigger aspect is it's your road to freedom, it's your road to an independent person. And in earlier generation, it was a two-wheeler or a four-wheeler when somebody got, okay, now I can be on my own, I can get away from parents, and I can be on my own. That, that same role has today actually been taken up by a phone with the WhatsApp and whatever. So these, these were uh, some of the key angles from an insights perspective and you know, all of them, I mean many of them, if you if you are a brand and if you can find a way to utilize those in your engagements, all of them have huge opportunity to be used in digital media, in social media, I was trying to give you some sort of small sample as I was talking, that's the key. So understanding those, if you're talking about youth markets, you know, social media is as such is finally a means to the end. That means, you know, if you're a, if you're a marketer, you, you'll sit with your problem statement that here, this is what I want to do as a brand, this is what I want to achieve, and then think, okay, which vehicles should I take? Should I take television? Should I take print? Should I take radio? Should I take digital? Should I take social? So it's finally your brand goals and your end results required are, are still the same. They don't change because social media has come. But the social media is, an, is a vehicle to get there and it's an interesting and effective vehicle. So if you were to use these brand insights for planning your television campaign or your brand campaign, equally as much you have to use the same understanding, your same insights for a social media campaign also. And that's what the whole aspect of understanding this behavior pattern of youth was all about. Coming to actual brand engagements. Now, you know, in terms of numbers, how we are a young country and what's the market is definitely interesting. It's something that all brands, from a cola brand to a shoe brand to an insurance brand to a mutual fund brand, everybody wants a slide number. Okay, that's where the numbers are. So that's, that's what everybody wants. But the point is wanting and doing is different. So you are a mutual fund brand, say oh the big market is the youth market because we have so many young people in the country and then you still go out and put your boring old ad which no young person is going to look at you are not doing anything about it, you are just saying I want the market and I'm, I mean, I'll, instead of in that boring text ad instead of showing an older person you show a younger person that's not doing anything, you are not connected so it's like then it becomes old wine in new bottle so it doesn't connect, you are still pretty much on traditional media and in the traditional media communication you put it into a new media doesn't matter. Communication has not changed. You're still talking the same kind of boring talk. Doesn't connect. Also the place where you act. So, you know, what's what what are the young people more likely to be doing? Reading a newspaper or perhaps spending time on Facebook. And yet, where does the marketing more marketing money go? You know, you want the youth market. You know that they are not likely to be reading the newspaper as much as they are going to be on Facebook or places like that. And where yet, when you are sanctioning your budgets, 90% of the budgets still go on print and television all, and then some loose change of 10, 5, 10% is going to digital. So, are you walking the talk as a as a brand? You you say that oh, I want to reach the youth market, and you're still going after places where your market is not even there. But that's unfortunate legacy of the old understanding and you know, a lot of the marketers have not understood the new space, the new media and they are happy to keep doing the old things, okay, sadly, unfortunately that's not delivering them results. So using social media then is not about carpet bombing, like traditional media otherwise is, you know, when you put a television ad, you are not sharply targeting, you know, even if you say, oh, I'll pick that particular you know, program, I mean, I'll pick the cricket match or I'll pick that particular soap opera or I'll pick that reality show, 
you're still pretty much bombarding because there are a large number of people of all kinds who are probably watching that show. Whereas social media is actually social slash digital, you can say, allows you to have very specific, focused, targeting, <coughs> objective driven and measurable. That's the opportunity which social media provides you. Also, why is it necessary? You know, if you're especially trying to sell something to the young people, why is it even necessary? Is because fundamentally the way purchase decisions are being taken by people has changed. Okay, there was there was a traditional what we call it a funnel journey of uh, purchase journey for funnel wise. Now, what is the funnel journey? So, let's say you wanted to buy a, a, a motor vehicle. Let's say you wanted to buy a car, a small car. You know, uh, so. The old way would be that you will identify all the options available in that category. So if you are looking at a small car, you look at all the different, you know, 12 different models or 15 different models which are there. You will make a list of them and then <coughs> gradually you will eliminate by whatever means. So by, you know, seeing brochures or going and taking test drives or talking to people or experts or whatever. Gradually you will zero down to the final choice. But you start with the funnel, the whole big choice. Today, the buying decision journey has changed. The first, what, what, okay, I'll, uh, instead of uh, looking at the slide, I'll just tell you. What happens is that today, a person doesn't necessarily start with the entire range of options. So if it's a car, and if I want to buy a small car, there are maybe two or three names which come to my mind from whatever, some top of mind recall is there. Okay, so let me look at the Centro and maybe the Alto or whatever just comes to mind. And that's the start of my buying journey process. Then I start talking to people or I go and see blogs, I see videos or I go to the store, showroom and you know, experience it. Now as I do this, what can happen is, I will not necessarily filter, funnel down the choice. I might drop one or two of the original brands, one or two others may come into my consideration. So. The choices, it's, not, it's an elastic thing. It doesn't completely go down as a funnel. I started with three, one or two disappeared because I found something in my evaluation that that doesn't work. Something else, somebody said, hey, why don't you try the Wegenar? It's really good. So, okay, Wegenar comes into the play. It was not in the original consideration, but it comes into the play. So, there is a certain flexibility in the evaluation stage, which finally somehow or the other leads to the point, point of buying. So, this is how it happens. So, initially, you have an awareness or consideration space, then you have an evaluation space where you are engaging across different kinds of touch points and trying to see if, you know, whether you are on the right track, you are, some new brands get added, some ones, some, some ones get dropped, that's a crucial stage, which finally somehow led to the buying point where there are often point of sale issues where maybe somebody is offering a deal or whatever, so that's the buying lure, the buying point is the lure that buy this you will get one year insurance free or this or that whatever kind of deals which are there. The earlier consumer journey from a brand's point of view would end at the buying point. The funnel happened as a brand I managed to get myself in that concentration space whatever elimination happened they came to the buying point I put a nice large discount to try to get them maybe I got them maybe he bought my product as far as I'm concerned, my journey with this buyer is over. Reality today is that it doesn't get over because there is a post-purchase advocacy loop where the person is continuing to talk about the purchase he made. So it could be a car, it could be a camera. You bought a camera, you, you know, you, you say you went to Twitter, you, you had a short list, say, okay, Canon 6, 600 or whatever, or Nikon this or whatever, this is my this is what I'm considering and you put it out on Facebook or Twitter and people start talking back to you, you know, don't use this, this one has this problem, why have you tried this, this is a semi DSLR, it's equally good, why don't you try that and you start looking at blogs, you try to see some videos, maybe you think oh this is a good idea, maybe I don't need this DSLR, maybe I need the semi DSLR, so it, that's the whole evaluation stage, if you finally decide okay I'm buying and then you look around Flipkart and Chroma and whatever, so oh, Flipkart is offering a deal on this, so that's why I buy that's your point of sale. You make a purchase, does it, does it get over at that point? Definitely not. Now you have a camera. Now you're going to go out and shoot pictures, you're going to put them up. You're going to say, oh, 
in the night time I'm getting this kind of results, this is really neat. But I don't like it, it's really bulky, I don't find it easy to carry. So you're continuing to talk and that conversation is that whole loyalty loop which will influence other buyers. Okay. Now what happens in the traditional approach of marketers, if they continue to have that whole funnel consideration of buyer, they used to put most of the budgets to get into the consideration space that when, when he starts looking at uh, options, my brand should be in that. So I bombard with my constant communication, advertising, etc. that in his top of mind recall my name will come. So they spend money on that place and the big money is otherwise spent on the discounts and deals at the point of sale. There is not much happening because traditional uh, journey did not involve too much in between. Reality today because that whole uh, you know uh, elasticity is there in the evaluation stage, you may get your brand in the top of mind original consideration but because of the you know inputs which are coming from friends and uh, the review sites and all that, maybe your brand drops off because you have not seen that whole bunch of review sites are talking that your brand doesn't work. There's a problem. This is not working. Now you're not bothered to track that space. You have not invested digital effort to see what's going on, on what are the people talking about, what are the review sites talking about, what are the referrals going. In that process, in the evaluation stage, the person will drop your brand out. And hence, at the point of sale, whatever you might have invested, he's not even considering you. He has talked to, uh, zeroed down on two other brands, your competitors. Somehow, supposing in some cases, you do make it to the final list and you get bought, your purchase, your brand is purchased. You stop at that point. Now, the point is that there is a huge post-purchase experience that the person is sharing, again on these forums, <laughs> which is going to determine his repeat purchase tomorrow or also his friend and other people's purchase. Are you tracking that? Are there good experiences that are being shared which you may want to amplify so that you know customer's word is better than your word? He's sharing that he is having good experience or he's finding some problems, are you addressing it? So that it, you know you arrest that negative flow and you know let flow let others. Now all of that, first of all we're talking youth market, so that's the medium where they're spending the most time. The purchase decision is very crucially linked to the evaluation and loyalty loop and as a brand if you want to engage if you don't get there if you don't are uh, not participate to that whole social space you are missing out so you know are our brands really allocating budgets for those crucial evaluate stage as well as a post purchase loyalty loop so today what happens in a traditional marketing sense most budgets are put to creative and to media. So you will get a very expensive television commercial made and then you will buy expensive media on Star Plus and Sony and whatever. All the monies are going there. The fact is that allocations today are mostly about platforms. So should I put radio, should I put out of form, should I put print. <coughs> With digital largely getting loose change what is left, which is the sad part. And especially for youth markets, that doesn't work. <coughs> what is required in what we call as Budgets for non-work areas, creative and media have always been thought of as areas which require budget allocation. There is a thing which needs to get into marketers' heads that there are other areas today which demand money, <coughs> which are non, which is creating, managing, and monitoring owned and earned media. So, owned media is your Facebook page or your Twitter handle or your YouTube page or whatever. Earned is when people are talking about you, whether on forums, on mouth shut, on various review sites, TripAdvisor, whatever are these kind of places people are talking about you, are you monitoring them, are you, uh, are you responding to queries there, you need people for that, you need budgets for that. So that's essentially required, that's the whole part of uh, social media activities. So that's broadly the thoughts around what to do, how to use social media for your brand and why. Do you have a question? Sir, as you have said, social media is particularly targeted towards youth markets. So, uh, if you assume any product which is targeting the older market of, uh, does not have any segmentation for older and the newer markets, then how can social media help in such cases? No, I am not saying it is only meant for youth market. I was but this, this talk being about how to use social media for youth market is, that's why it is catered to that. Also, I'm saying for youth market, if you don't use it, if as a brand, you choose to avoid or you choose to still hesitate or don't do it right, 
you are clearly missing out because you are spending a lot of time and all this is happening the way the purchase decisions are taken. If you still feel that I will do the old way or I just put a big ad and get people to see my product and then I just give discount and I don't do anything else, then you are clearly missing out is what I was talking about. But if you are saying that, okay, mine is not for a youth market, it's for a mixed market, it's for everybody, there's a different strategy for that, you know. It's not that the non-youth are not present. See, the, there's, there's an interesting graph that uh, I've seen. It's just try to visualize what I'm trying to say, the graph. There, there are two bars. So there's an age group on the x-axis. So you have 18 to 24, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45 to 50, whatever, some age groups. And on each age group, there are two bars. One bar is percentage of people on the internet from that age group. And the second bar next to it is percentage of people in the population. Are you getting it? So 18 to 24, if I see that there is 45% of the internet population supposing is that, for example, I also see next to it that 54% of the population is that. Okay. And if I look at 55 to 65, I find that 7% or 9% of the of the internet population is on of that age group. I also find that population is only 7%. So if there are 100 people, now usually there are 100 people in population, if there are 7 people in the 55 to 65 years of age group, okay, now think that out of 150 are on internet and 3 of them were in the 55 to 65 age group. Now what, what's the issue, you know, in the same proportion as one is in the population, in that proportion you will find them on internet. So if I wanted 500, you know, 100 people, they are not there, there's the population only not there. Are you getting it? Are you getting the whole logic? I wish there was a board I could have explained this better, but the, the point to make is that you, you're talking more about youth brand because there's a larger youth population. Also, larger youth population, a lot of them being digital natives, there's a larger proportion of these people being comfortable on the internet, whether it is to use internet for regular day-to-day -day conversation with an email and chat and all, or also to shop, also to do you know, net banking, etc. They are comfortable. There are fewer people in the higher age groups. Out of the fewer people, few of them are also on the internet. So, if I'm, so for example, we have some clients in, let's say, the mutual fund area. Now, the mutual fund as a business is, you know, even if they wish to target the youth, the youth do not, are not the target segment from a, an understanding of mutual funds and also be, uh, you know, having capital, first of all, at that age to put away in the investment category. If they have extra money, they put in the bank and, you know, just put a fixed deposit or something. So, for fixed, for mutual funds, our client is clearly looking at, you know, 25 and above or 35 and above and 45 and above. But yet, large chunks of the budgets are going into digital media because you think that who is investing in mutual funds? It's an educated person. It's a person with, uh, you know, large of metro, uh, metro person, educated, literate, having a financial understanding. He is very, very likely to also be on the internet. And today he is very likely to also be on social media, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. So to reach that person, if I put a hoarding, I'm going to reach all masses, all kinds of demography, educated, uneducated, male, female, everybody. Whereas if I go to social media, I'm going to reach exactly the desired audience. So a mutual fund company today finds a lot of connect to get to social media as against, irrespective of the age group, even though they are targeting a higher age group. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, now it is uh, very evident that uh, uh, online marketing is the coming, uh, coming big thing in India. Um, again, uh, at one end where Flipkart is investing around 55 crores of rupees per month on the online marketing, where uh, a, 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 a window purchaser, a window market, a window buyer, a, a buyer to doing window marketing, uh, so window purchasing has uh, on 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 uh, if a if a buyer is doing window purchasing online, for it a uh, uh, online e-commerce site like Flipkart is investing investors 25 rupees on single click. So, uh, if someone wants to have his own e-commerce site, what would be the cheapest uh, mode of online marketing which uh, he or she should do uh, on it? Because otherwise, it would be too expensive for someone who have, wants to start his own and want to uh, do online marketing as well. 
So it's it's like if you are a startup company and getting into say e-commerce and you are pitting yourself against a giant like Flipkart and if you are, do not have a fundamental business differentiator which means that you know you are selling the same products that Flipkart sells you are giving the same kind of price or maybe more I mean what's your business plan? How would you expect to succeed? Right? Just hear me out. Just hear me out. So at the outset obviously if you are there and if you think you have a your business opportunity, you have something to differentiate. Whether it's customer service, whether it's a unique range of products, there's something differentiating which you have. So I'm assuming that maybe you have product categories which are not offered by Flipkart, you have a customized version which they are not offering. So whatever. So you find that okay, A, you have a reason to take it's not just e-commerce versus e-commerce. It's a consumer's need. I if I need a camera or if I need a mobile phone, which is a standard SKU so and so, Nokia, Lumia, etc. I mean, you can't, so whatever. As a newcomer, if you don't have the big deep pockets which they have, you might find it difficult. But if you are selling something which needs engraving and personalization or experience selling, and that's your niche. So it's there's no. It's not about his spend versus your spend. You are spending a different category. You are spending on a certain service which is a different need of a consumer. Now you can definitely spend on say Google keywords. Or you can create a social, a Facebook page and nurture that particular type of consumer who values that. Okay, so if you have some exotic flower designs for as a gift, that's your that's your key category. Nurture the kind of consumer who looks at that and you know, build a community around that. Keep sharing with them new designs. Keep talking to them, asking them their opinions. You know, you're building a base, and word of mouth will take it further. That's very cheap. Or if it's a thing which is required, it's a need. Supposing you are doing online sale of wedding invitation cards, you have hundreds of designs which Flipkart is not into. That's the thing. Now you buy Google keywords around ex excellent wedding invitation card keywords, and you put your Google ads out. You now that's at a low cost, relatively speaking, and you're getting the absolute right kind of audience to come. And then when they come, your website should showcase your excellent range and differentiate. <coughs> That's your business option. If you're taking the same category, same thing, and you're trying to say, okay, I'll take on Flipkart, that's basically a business challenge. Right? I don't think it's easy to get there. Okay. Somebody else had a question there? Yeah. Uh, sir, my question is basically, youth is now not loyal to a particular social media. They use Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So if I as a company launch a particular product or, or a new feature and if I want a feedback from all these platforms, so it might be a chance that a particular user is giving me feedback from all the four platforms. Yeah. So data may be extrapolated or maybe not that trustworthy. So there are any techniques or some, thing, some sort of things is done on those kind of data? Or so one of the biggest challenges for brands today is uh, what is known as big data. right? So there are just a whole lot of data points which is getting generated from various places online, offline, all kinds of places you walk into a store, you swipe a card you, you know, do everything, there is somewhere some data points getting put out the challenge for a brand is to know you as a consumer across your various data touch points you know, here is where you came and walked into a store and you use a loyalty card here is where you came to Facebook and liked the page here is where on a different email ID you are receiving my emails and I am seeing whether you are clicking, opening, not opening. Here is where you came and you know uh, saw a YouTube video and left a comment. But all of them are different handles, different IDs. So the big challenge for, for brands is to find a way to connect all this. Not easy but there are tools, there are analytics, there are things which are happening where uh, brands are investing. So for, for example telecom operators. So I will tell you about Vodafone. I am a Vodafone customer. You know so if I call in and if I give my number, they have my entire history of my Vodafone usage. So they know from when I am a customer, what's my average bill, how well I pay or not pay, am I a good pay master. So they have some credit history and everything. <coughs> now today if my I have a problem on Vodafone, I tweet. I say, oh my god, this my I'm not getting this problem. I mean Vodafone sucks, whatever. Now Vodafone handle reaches out to me that uh, please DM us your number and we'll get back to you. So I DM my number and then somebody connects back to me and you know problem gets solved. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's important for them to record my Twitter ID along with my customer record. So now they've enhanced my customer record 
So tomorrow if I am saying something on Twitter without even asking me, they know that this Twitter handle is the same this customer and they can see how important customer I am or not. So if I am otherwise being a good customer for them and great credit history, I, I ring up a good bill every month and if I am complaining, can they address it better? As again somebody who is a constant complainer who keeps going and giving clips, so maybe they will ignore them. So the whole enhancement of understanding the customer across the various touch points has to happen as a process inside an organization. <coughs> it's not easy, but it's an ongoing effort. And that's it. Companies have to invest into it. But it will depend upon each organization. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's, there is no shortcut. <coughs> each organization has to invest. There is nothing. No, nobody is going to come and give you on platter that, oh, here's the data, this Pinterest, this YouTube, take it. You have to, as a company, you have to invest. So I'll take you through a quick case study, which was something which we did a while back. But it's still <coughs> makes an interesting study. So, so the brand was Channel V. It's an old case study, but it's still interesting and relevant. What was involved? The target group was college students. Channel V, as a brand, reaches out to college students, one of the top target segment with the address. So they wanted to address college students from across the country. The purpose was an event that they were doing, which was at that time India's largest intercollegiate event. It was called, it's called India Fest. I think it keeps happening year after year. And it was happening in Goa. It was the first time it was being done. The goal was to reach as large a number of people as possible, as large a number of college students as possible in the shortest of time and as lower cost. I mean, that's the marketer's wish list always. Maximum reach, minim, minimum wastage, lowest cost, right? So that's what they wanted to do. And this was the event. Nokia India Fest uh, you know, happening there. So we we had to you know we worked with them and said okay how do we use social media? So first of all fundamentals of social media what works what doesn't right? So as a brand uh, we recommend that don't try to create farm wheels or mafia wars or whatever. I mean you you know that's that's a business by itself. Zynga has a business to create farm wheel and engage for a long time. You're a brand. Keep it simple, keep it you know, relatively low cost and just make it happen. So that's one, what, one thing which works. Uh, the causes, so we say causes in Twitter account, causes that get large participation are not the kind which are talking about changing the world, oh world peace and all that. You may get a like here and there but that's not what you know, generates passion amongst your consumers. But more simpler issues in life, something which a consumer or a young person especially can relate to quickly. Remember when we talked about youth characteristics, you me about me, it's, it's what's in it for me kind of thing. Right? Passion drives viral engagement. It's, it's some, if I'm passionate about something, I'll take effort to do something more. I'll let word out and you know get, get things moving. Armchair activism works. Okay? You ask people to come on the street and come and fight with you, they may or may not do. But you say, oh, you know, you click a like and I'll, somebody will grow a tree somewhere. I'm happy to click a like and say, oh, I did my good deed, right? So this is a kind of armchair activism. I'm not going out and, you know, putting a seed of a tree myself. I did a like and I feel that I've actually put a tree here. So armchair activism actually works, you know. Uh, impulsive participation is good. Can you make it so simple that on an impulse I can do something, okay? So, don't make somebody go through a whole lot of effort to do something. Make it so impulsive that it's like a no-brainer. There should be an easy way to recruit more participation. So how can you make it simple to grow the holders? You know, like you've got five people, can it become 50 quickly? Is it easy to get more and more people to come in? In doing all this, stay close to your core TG and your core focus area. So if you are a, what? If you are a food brand and then you do a Bollywood engagement which has no connect to your brand or your business, you may get engagement because Bollywood works but then does it do anything to your brand, does it do anything to your core focus area that you wanted people to sort of relate to your food and you know maybe experience it, your pizza brand or whatever. If it doesn't then you know you're missing it. So can you find a way to keep close to your PG and to your focus area in terms of business? So. With all those learnings, all those kind of simple understandings, we came up with this basic idea. Make your college the subse like college <coughs> in the country. And if you do that, 
you win 5 lakhs for your college. Okay? There's a lot of interesting things here. I'm giving a student an option to make his or her college the subse light college in the country. <coughs> so it's not about you, it's not about you the consumer, but your college. Are you passionate about it? Are you going to drive it? And you're not even getting anything yourself. There's no prizes to win for you. If your college comes out first, your college will win 5 lakhs. Now, when we put this out, we did have our set of doubts. Will it work? We thought this fundamentally it was addressing an interesting thing, but we were not sure that you know it's not about the student himself or herself. Will they engage? There's no prizes to win for them. Will they you know make it big? So what was involved? The application, it was an application which ran on Facebook. On the Facebook page there was what we call the pre-like lure. So you come to the, you know, you, you drive people to the page, like this to know more or something. So you've got to like the page. So you in the process you make people like the page. So at least the page likes were going up in the uh, post like there was a revelation. So you have a sort of a mystery angle, click here to know more or something like that. You click the like and then you see a post like page which shows something, you know, uh, something, some revelation. That's called a fan build strategy. The display picture on the Facebook page constantly promoted the activity as you can see the center square, the V subset like college thing. There was a simple three step process of participation was highlighted. The process was go and like your college. If you don't find your college, add your college and then like it. So while we had a long list of colleges which is already in the database, in case some remote college or something was not found, you had a choice to go and add your college and then go and like. So your college will get your like. So you are trying to build the likes. There was an option for a person to vote for more than one college. We said that people could have gone to more than one college in life. So why restrict them to only like one? So in that sense, we also wanted more votes, sir. You, know, you, you can get 1000 people and maybe get 2000 votes or whatever. That was the idea. So that was allowed. Logic being that you could like more than one college for whatever reason. On, there was a mini page for each college. When you go and click Nitty, you will find a small page giving some information. And you would see the names and photos of all the people who have liked that college like that. Supposing Nitty was showing. 2000 words at a point or 200 words, you could actually see the people who had liked that college. Now you might easily find somebody you know, oh wow, this my friend is already liked. So you know, kind of there's a relate when, you know, uh, anytime Facebook ads happen, often you you find, you know, your so-and-so friend is like this. That's a way, that's a, it's a, again a psychology that if my so-and-so friend is like this page, might be interesting, your, your level of intrigue increases and you're more likely to explore that. So the same thing we were using, you go to Nitty page, you find name and photos, they were ordered in, in terms of your connection. So if you are logged into Facebook, which is how you will go to the page, if there are people you are friends with and they were there, they would show up first. So you would see if some, some of your friends had already liked the page. There was a leaderboard which was quite prominently shown that which college was on the top and your college was on what number. So you say, oh, I'm on the fourth position. Uh, and uh, if you think that oh, I'm only so many likes away from being the top college, maybe you can go and spread the word further in your college. Today. Go and like it, and you know, let's let's make our college number one. Very next to it, very quickly, there was an invite friends thing. So you know how to recruit more very easily. That was the whole point. That quickly next to it, there was an invite friends. So it's quite expected that if you are from a certain college, you would have friends in your Facebook network who are also from that college. And it was very easy for you to click, find those friends and make them to go and like this page. And of course, Subsea Like College was also promoted on various college forums and groups on Facebook. Regular posts around this happened from the Channel Week Facebook page. So with all those kind of efforts, and it was all about, so whatever, go find your college, like it, okay. But in the process, the results were astounding. We ran this for a period of about 50 days before that event was happening. When we started, the Channel V fan base was around 343,000. <coughs> In 50 days, it hit 648,000, close to 90% roughly growth in a matter of 90% growth and mostly through organic ways. There was some media just spent, 
channel we of course promoted it a little bit on the television but tele if television was easy to reach the people they don't need facebook the fact was at that time even today there is a larger number of people connected and relating to channel v on social and digital media than they are viewers on television you know unlike general entertainment channels like star plus or sony most of the channel most of the niche channels whether it's star world star movie and we've done we've done a lot of work with the entire set of star channels there is more connection or more people connecting with the brand on digital media than on television television has become a niche audience for all these channels so for them it's a compulsion to be on this media and the same thing was with channel v the television was not, never going to be enough otherwise they don't need anything if television then why should they advertise anywhere else but this is where they could actually jump the numbers to as much as you know 90% growth in a matter of 50 days and plus fundamentally get the word out india fest every person who kind of connected engaged you know almost 350000 people through this engagement also got to hear about india fest and they were that was a big goal that they had that like collegians hear about india fest which will drive participation in the festival itself so it was a amazing success very very simple idea connected well so you know that ends my talk like said this initiative was started couple of years back but at that time it was quite a, a new idea but then these days when you see there are a lot of parallel ideas running all together Correct. so more and more users are getting very much spammed because of these messages